Chapter 41 He had not expected him to be like this however. Behind him, the branches quivered as Eduardo stepped out. Sam? What's going on? Dash Eduardo ducked to avoid a lunging gremlin, beheading it as it passed with a swift cut of his rapier. Behind him, Reaper emerged, his hands glowing with gray light. The ectoplasm master snapped his hands together and sent out a beam of gray energy that hollowed out the head of one of the gremlins. Elminster Judge started to cackle madly and started to dance on the forest floor. There was something deeply disturbing about the cabalistic scene, a man surrounded with monsters, acting without a care in the world. The three allies fought against the gremlins, killing them in a steady stream of essence, but barely making a dent in the massive horde. As they died, their bodies disappeared and Sam saw something strange happen. Their bodies reappeared next to Elminster, but noticeably smaller than before. He was resurrecting the dead gremlins and sending them back at them to fight. That explained why he still had so many of them at this stage of the forest. How he had gotten them into the arena was a mystery however. Eventually, they had whittled the gremlin's strength down to about that of a normal, one-foot-tall, gremlin and they dispatched them with ease. There seemed to be a limit to the number of times that they could be resurrected, and they had reached that. Elminster stood there in the middle of the clearing seemingly unaware that his creatures had died. Sam shared a meaningful look with Eduardo and they advanced, ready to kill the man. Anyone who allied with monsters was not a threat that should be suffered to live. As they neared, the madman seemed to wake up and see the corpses around him. What? No. No. My family. All dead. You will pay. His voice began to grow deeper as he spoke and his body began to bulge. The gremlin corpses began to sizzle and small streams of green light erupted out of their bodies and swarmed Elminster like a flock of tiny stars. They plunged into his flesh and he began to turn green. His body had bulked up to over ten feet tall and his musculature was ridiculously embiggened, making him look like a certain green comic character. I will kill you. The Elminster turned massive gremlin said, his voice distorted. The man leapt into the air and came down like a lookador, hands outstretched behind his head. Both of them landed in a devastating hammer fist, slamming Sam into the ground. He struggled against the force pressing down on him, but somehow this man was even stronger than him. Sam grunted and began to channel his Tao of anger, making sure not to lose himself in it. A flood of incandescent rage coursed through his body and he began to bulk up as well. Nowhere near as much as Elminster, but enough to be noticeable. His hair stood up on end, wreathed in an orange light. He lifted his knee and brought it up, crashing into Elminster's solar plexus. The massive man was knocked backwards with a whoosh of expelled breath, knocking over a tree as he flew. Sam was nowhere near spent yet however and he stalked across the ground, leaving small scorch marks on the earth. Elminster staggered to his feet, growling in a bestial timbre. Eduardo and Reaper cautiously approached and stood next to Sam, ready to assist him. Sam was beginning to lose himself in his rage. He had just lost two of his teammates to monsters and now there was this human traitor who sided with them? That would not be allowed to exist. Somewhere deep down, his Tao of the Arbiter was screaming at him that his motivations were not right, but he forced it down by using eyes of judgment on the man. He was as black as sin. Sam beat his chest in a fit of animal rage and charged forwards, with his mace held high. He leaped ten feet into the air and began to pump raw Tao energy into the weapon. It did not want to go in, but he pushed and pushed until some barrier deep within him cracked and the mace flooded with pure rage. It glowed with a bright orange light, looking for all the world like a chunk of lava, dragged out of the thonic depths of the earth. Sam brought it down on Elminster and the head of the mace seemed to detonate with a fiery explosion of pure conceptual rage. A shockwave of heat and light exploded outwards from the mace and obliterated Elminster utterly, but also sending Sam flying backwards, the last of his rage leaving him. A system notification blared in his vision, but he could not click it because of how tired he was. Everything faded away and he lost track of reality. Arbiter? Are you alive? A weak slap connected with his cheek, snapping him out of his slumber. Well what's happening? The hazy figures of his surviving teammates swam in his vision, staring down at him. He immediately reached for his mask, to make sure that it was on. It was. Eduardo chuckled. A few of these lads wanted to take it off, but after that little display with your mace, they decided that it was best to just speculate who was under it. Sam clasped hands with the Italian exorcist and was pulled to his feet with a strong yank. A little bit dizzy, Sam swayed on his feet before he found his balance. Sitting back down again, he checked his notifications. You have killed Elminster Judge. You have leveled up. Sam quickly allocated his points, sinking another three into dexterity. He had still been too slow to avoid that smash from Elminster, which the others had dodged easily. Now he felt like he could have done so if he wanted to, with the newfound speed filling his body. 
There was another notification as well underneath it. You have gained the skill, basic Dao channeling, legendary. The Dao is the way. The way is everything. You can channel an infinitesimal fraction of everything, and now you can channel some of that fraction into your weapons. Use this skill cautiously, for too much Dao expenditure without a means of recouping it can be fatal. Using your Dao for this purpose will imbue your weapon with a small portion of its concept, empowering it beyond its normal parameters. Chapter 42 That explained the feeling of draining that he felt when he had imbued the weapon. It was literally extracting some of his Dao out of him in a way that meant that it was hard to replenish. If he didn't watch out, he could turn into a Dao well, and no wells were ever bottomless. He did not want to know what would happen if one lost all of their Dao energy. For now, he felt fine, as he must not have put much of his Dao into the attack. His natural strength had been enough to deal the finishing blow, with only a little assistance. Sam got to his feet easily enough and determined that there were no long-lasting effects from his exertion. Giving the other members of his group a reassuring smile, Sam set the pace for the rest of the journey. Despite his outward energy, inside he felt more than a little perturbed. His Tao of anger was becoming more and more prominent, with his other Tao falling by the wayside. Even though he had achieved a deepening of his Tao of the Arbiter, somehow anger was winning out. He needed to find a balance for them, and quickly at that before he was consumed by his wrath. Sam made sure not to tap into any of his latent rage as he attacked the monsters that waited in the shadows to waylay the party. They were definitely nearing the center now, as the concentrations of monsters were becoming nearly suffocating. Sam was just about able to keep up with his additional points into dexterity and thankfully there were no more deaths. A few serious injuries, but nothing immediately fatal. Sam and his stronger companions were doing a good job of keeping the others safe from the many threats that the woods had to offer. To Sam, it was nowhere near enough however. He felt a small sense of relief as his Tao of the Arbiter found its purpose again, as the shepherd of a flock of innocent sheep, unjustly sent to their deaths. It was perhaps a naive analogy, but it worked for the situation. He was quickly discovering that half of all Tao work was mental, and the other half was finding a way to use that mental energy in the real world. The sound of fighting rang out up ahead of them and Sam called for a stop. The others immediately halted, trusting his judgment. Sam edged forwards to survey the scene. A pitched battle was occurring on the forest floor about 50 feet away from them. Two teams were having at it, bright streaks of fire and bolts of ice soaring across the air towards the other sides. More than a few corpses lay on the ground and Sam saw that three figures were dominating the fight. Two of them were on one side, and the other was holding his own against them. The two allied fighters were both women, but one of them wore a mask. Sam was able to tell her gender from the cut of her clothing and the way that she moved. She was obviously a novice at fighting, but her stats seemed to make up the difference. Strangely, she seemed to lack a certain part of her fighting style, as Sam saw her pause multiple times during the fight, as if waiting for something to happen. The other woman had no such problem and she was a very capable fighter, sending arrows streaking towards her enemies like blurs of light in the darkness. On the other side was a giant of a man, who Sam instantly recognized. It was the bear of the motherland, the Russian fighter who had tied against Reaper in the tournament. He was clearly outmatched by the two, but not by much. His axe thrum through the air as he blocked the attacks of the two women, although he was not able to do much more than that. They moved too in sync for him to land any telling blows and his body was already covered in wounds. As Sam watched, not wanting to interfere, the man let out a grunt of frustration and began to claw at himself with his hands. As his nails tore through his skin, sheets of blood began to run down his body, far more than such small scratches should have caused. Patches of earth and stone rose up from the ground underneath him, coating him in a suit of rocky armor that was, of course, shaped like a bear. Sam was once again perplexed at how these people were creating such effects with his attacks. So many fighters that he had seen possessed elemental effects with their attacks, but he had no such ability. Sure, his Tao was almost unfairly powerful, but who didn't want to be able to conjure up fire with a thought? Sam heard a faint rustle in the bushes behind him that signaled the arrival of his compatriots, but he motioned for them to retreat. This was not something that he wanted to meddle in if he did not have to. The arrival of more fighters could have an adverse effect on the situation, perhaps even causing the other teams to band up against them. He was happy to watch them for now, hopeful to find out more about their fighting styles from his observations. There was a good chance that he would have to fight them at some point. With his life on the line, in a way that it had been not in the arena, the bear was clearly not holding anything back. His moveset was far more varied than Sam had expected, integrating all sorts of earth-related attacks. Most of them were very simplistic in nature, hinting at a simple mind behind the craggy visage of the man. The women on the other hand were clearly more imaginative, but neither of them had any flashy abilities, 
so they had to rely on displays of acrobatics that would have made any pre-system human weep with jealousy. Flips and one-handed cartwheels blended into a deadly dance of flashing steel, their weapons singing a song of death and blood. They were starting to have trouble dealing with their opponent however, as their bladed weapons were almost useless against the armor of their enemy. Sam edged in even closer, eager to see how the fight progressed, but a twig snapped under his foot and the warring cultivators froze. They turned as one towards the bushes, catching sight of Sam's frozen visage. He waved apologetically and then dropped to the ground as a stalactite of sharpened rock soared through where his head had been. Enhanced body or not, that would have hurt. He winced as he saw the projectile carve straight through a tree behind him like it was made of soft cheese. It was exactly as he had expected. They had united against the greater threat as soon as he had arrived. Chapter 43 Sam could understand why. For a morally gray fighter, as it seemed most people here were, it would be advantageous to remove a potential threat in a setting in which there was no option to surrender. Sam moved forward rather than retreat, not waiting to draw them towards his allies. Vaulting over yet another attack, Sam brought his mace down towards one of the women. It missed them by a mile, but he did not really want to hurt them. Apparently, his companions had other ideas. Reaper charged out of the bushes, ectoplasm at the ready, heading straight towards the bear. The man roared like an angry bull at the sight of the slight man, and charged him with his axe at the ready. At least that was one threat that Sam did not have to deal with. Eduardo emerged far more elegantly, his rapier outstretched in a manner that reminded Sam of the depictions of medieval duels of honor that he had sometimes seen in books. Rather than take a bow however, the man thrust out his sword and sent a beam of white light straight towards the ladies. They scattered to the side and Sam picked his target. He was undoubtedly the strongest between him and Eduardo, so he picked the more skilled of the two and chased her down. She was a lot faster than him, but he had more stamina and he caught up soon enough. She snarled at him and raised her short sword menacingly. Well, it would have been menacing if she was not barely over five feet tall and perhaps a hundred pounds soaking wet, but it was the thought that counted. She gritted her teeth and started to speak, her voice a serenade of rage and frustration. Damn you, Arbiter. How dare you take what's mine by right? Sam was confused and this showed on his face, prompting an explanation. The first place on the Dow leaderboard was mine by right, and you stole it. Now I have no chance to get it. The woman was completely delusional, but Sam tried to reason with her. Who the hell even are you? I've never seen you before in my life. It was true. She was utterly unremarkable in every way and he was sure that he would have remembered such a person, if only for that reason. He would have remembered her height as well, and was sure that he had never seen her. Why would the first place on the leaderboard be yours? It's a matter of skill, not desire, Sam continued. Instead of answering with a normal response, she hissed at him and launched into a series of attacks that were completely without the style and grace that she had shown earlier. To Sam's surprise, they were imbued with something that almost felt like a Dao. It was clearly not a Dao, the feeling was far too weak, but she was definitely on the way to one. To his surprise, he could detect a small part of what the Dao was of, which he had never really had a chance to do before with any other Dao wielder. He focused in on her aura and was able to extrapolate it from that. Sam could not get an exact reading, but it was something along the lines of covetousness or greed. From his own experience with the Dao, it was very good at manipulating emotions. That explained why she felt so entitled to the position. With a smile on his face, Sam asked her a very important question. What's your name? She stopped her attacks for a moment, confused. What? Why does that matter? You're going to die soon anyway. But I suppose I can tell you. It's Karen. Sam bent over laughing, opportunely missing the slash of the woman's sword that passed over his now lowered body. You piece of crap. How dare you laugh at me? I will make your death long and slow for that. Nobody defies me in lives. Sam rose up from his awkward position and deflected one of the sword swipes. Without bothering to explain to her what was so funny, he began to fight in earnest. Deciding not to risk using any of his Dao skills so soon after imbuing his weapon with it made the fight a lot harder, but it was manageable. After briefly checking the leaderboards during a lull in the fight, he found out that she was the number 21 ranker in the world. That explained how she and her friend had been able to fight the bear to a stalemate, but were not actually able to finish the fight. He checked on his allies every now and again, noting that they were doing well. Reaper had revealed a few more tricks in his arsenal that he, like the bear, had not revealed during his fight. His entire body was wreathed in spectral energy and he was easily the same size as his opponent in his suit of rocks and earth. In contrast to their evenly matched battle, Eduardo easily outfought his opponent and was almost casually weaving around her blows. Sam had no idea what the people in the Vatican had gotten up to behind closed doors before the system had arrived 
but it was quite impressive. Sam returned to his fight and he disarmed the woman with an artful twist of his mace, his enhanced stats allowing him to get enough of an edge over the woman to intuit her next move. It was almost like he had a miniature Sherlock Holmes inside his head, creating a series of deductions from his surroundings. It was pretty cool, hell it was extremely cool, but it was also quite strange. It had only been over a week now, and Sam was already so far past human that it was hardly believable. He raised his mace, but then thought better of it, instead reaching out with his free hand and punching the woman with it. She fell over, stunned and he walked away from her. She was a complete asshole, but not actually evil. Elminster had deserved death, but she only deserved a stern talking to and a few lessons in empathy. As Sam had neither the time nor the inclination to give those to her, this would have to suffice. Sam monitored the fights closely to determine which of his companions required more assistance than the other. Eduardo was basically toying with his opponent at this point so it was down to Sam to assist Reaper. He made his way over to the clashing titans of elemental energy and interposed himself, slamming his mace into the bear's rocky skin. The mace chinked off with an intense vibration and Sam almost lost his grip on the mace. Damn, that skin is hard. Sam thought as he reeled in his weapons. The target of his attack stared down at him with a menacing growl emanating from his lips, raising one stony paw to crush him into the ground. Reaper saw his opening and thrust his hand towards the underbelly of the rock construct, but it had been a ruse all along. The bear had revealed a keen intelligence with that maneuver, both getting a good look at his new assailant and gaining an advantageous position. He reached down with his paw and closed it over the hand of the spirit construct, squeezing down on it with a crude smile forming on the lips of his armor. Reaper screamed in pain, the ectoplasm apparently attached to his nervous system as well as his body. The man tore into the rock with his free hand, but it was useless. The bear was too far buried under the shifting mass of earth. He was a big man, but his suit of armor dwarfed him in its gargantuan scale. Sam had to use his Tao, there was no other choice in the matter. As he began to channel his power into his mace, bracing for the consequences, a breathtaking roar flattened his ears back to his head. It expanded over the woods like a shockwave, sending out a concentrated pulse of raw aura power. That was clearly where the boss was, and by the sound of it, it was something far out of his league. Sam gulped, and by the expressions of the others in the clearing, they were having similar reactions. Chapter 44 It was, surprisingly enough, Karen who breached the silence first. The woman had been jolted out of her unconsciousness by the cataclysmic sound that had ripped through the forest moments earlier. That was. Something that even I am not equipped to deal with. Her voice quavered as she spoke, a marked difference from her cocky attitude earlier. Sam would have wanted to take credit for her transformation but he knew that it was solely due to a healthy dose of fear. Finally mustering up the courage to ask for assistance, the woman continued. Sometimes, even a god among mortals must ask for help. I have deigned to let you all assist me in my endeavor to kill this foul monster. Sam sighed and Reaper looked at her with a flabbergasted expression on his face. What the hell is your deal, lady? No real person acts like that. Besides, you're even weaker than me anyway. The Arbiter would have already killed you if he hadn't decided to show mercy on your sorry ass. I'm not working with someone like you. Reaper stalked off and back into the woods, beckoning for Sam and Eduardo to come. Slowly, as if in a dream, the massive figure of the bear lumbered on after them. With an apologetic look on her face, Karen's ally walked off as well. The woman gnashed her teeth there and then in the forest clearing, but she knew that she was up a creek now. Rather than do the wise thing and try to resolve the matter, she made her own way off towards the source of the roar. Sam and his new allies made their way back to his group who all tensed upon seeing the unfamiliar faces. Calm down. These people are here to help us. I'm sure that you all heard the roar earlier? Reaper said to the team. They all nodded. Good. Well, not good for us, but good that you're listening. Reaper cleared his throat. Ahem. Anyway, the only way that we're going to beat this thing is with strength of numbers. These two are some pretty high rankers, and although I am pained to admit it, the bear here is ever higher ranked than me on the leaderboard. Apparently that does not apply to the arena however, as he was only able to draw against me. The massive Russian man growled warningly. It was a joke. It was a joke, Reaper hurriedly said. This information calmed down the members of their team, and a few of them even looked excited that they had received extra help. Unfortunately, none of the new arrival's allies had survived, but they would only have been a dead weight anyway. Sam and the other high rankers looked apologetically at the weaker members. They didn't have to say what everyone was thinking. The reality was, that none of them would likely be coming out of this unscathed. Even Sam would probably lose to whatever that thing was that had projected that domineering aura from the center of the forest. Sam could barely cover twenty feet with his aura at this point, and the roar had spread out for miles. 
It probably became stronger the closer one was to it, but it was still far and beyond anything that he could do. With a sigh, Sam realized what he had to do. The team members wouldn't like it, but it was for the best. Everyone except for Reaper, the Bear, the Angel of Death, and our new member, you all need to run back to the start of the woods. It's not safe for anyone here not in the top 50. Hell, it's barely safe for us anyway. He was met with a storm of argumentative speeches, but he ignored them. With a nod at Reaper, the man summoned condensed bats of energy behind each of the recalcitrant people and knocked them out. A small palanquin of gray energy formed underneath them and carried them back through the forest. Reaper stumbled, but then rose up again, panting. I can only hold that skill for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to have to leave them wherever they reach. I'm going to be tapped out for the boss fight, just so you know. Sam nodded and placed his hand on the man's shoulder. It seemed to bolster him somewhat, but in reality Sam wanted to segue into a new conversation. Just a quick question. How are you doing that stuff with the gray energy? You don't have a Tao, right? Reaper looked at Sam like he had sprouted a second head. Huh? What do you think I'm using? My elemental affinity of course. Sam cocked his head. What? What's that? Reaper sighed at this. Look, if this is some sort of joke, this is not the time. Didn't you receive the system missive about elemental affinities upon gaining your class? Everyone else did as far as I know. Sam shook his head. If everyone else had received this thing, then it was likely due to his strange Tao abilities. It was all starting to slot together, and the picture that it painted of the system was not pretty. It had hidden his Tao heritage from him until he had gained his class, and now it seemed to be hiding even more from him. In addition, Jeffrey had told him about the stigma that the system had against the Tao and how it had taken over its function in the universe. Was it possible that Sam had somehow gained the personal attention of the system, and worse, it was hostile? If that was true, why was he not already dead? The system was, from what he could tell, basically a god, perhaps more powerful than any god that a human had even conceived. If it had wanted him dead, it could have metaphorically snapped its fingers, and it would be so. He was being treated like some piece in a vast game board, and he did not like it one bit. The only way that he was going to survive was to look for any opportunity that he could get. This was the first one. Reaper, can you share this missive with me? The man looked confused, but he nodded. Then he furrowed his brow. Wait a sec. Why isn't it letting me share it with you? Something about an error. I'll just tell you, I guess. The man cleared his throat and began. An elemental affinity is your connection to one of the primordial elements. There are twelve of them, which you can find out about later. More importantly, upon getting a class, people find out what element they are most attuned to, and can attempt to form a connection with it. It's quite tough, but it grants you great power. Now, how you do it is Dash Reaper screamed and clapped his hands to his head. What in the name of God? All of the information was just sucked out of my head. It's all gone. Reaper looked at Sam with fear in his eyes. What did you do? Sam threw up his hands. Nothing. How would I do something like that? I'm not some sort of telepath. Reaper nodded. Okay, okay. You probably didn't do it. But I can't tell you anymore, it's gone. Good luck on finding your own path. Sam began to walk towards the bear, but the man backed away in fear. No, no thank you. I want my memories to stay right where they belong, my brain. Sam sighed and resigned himself to a lot of trial and error later. For now, he did not need whatever the others had. He already had his Tao, and that was enough to deal with whatever threat came their way. At least, he hoped it was. Now divested of their charges, the group was able to move at full speed. Sam rode on the back of the bear's armor and watched as they sped through the woods at around the speed of a car. He was probably faster than the man inside the suit, but it could cover more ground than him with every ponderous stride, so it was more efficient. Sam tried to pick up some small talk with the man, but he did not answer. Either he had no wish to talk to Sam, or he was too busy concentrating on the path ahead. Sam would have bet on the former of the two. After a few minutes, he gave up and closed his eyes, trying to survey the state of his Tao. It was very hard to check on his Tao, because there was no official stat for it, but a few seconds of meditation could reveal how much energy he had left. As he had expected, his Tao of anger was about half full, and his Tao of the Arbiter was almost completely full. He had enough in the tank for a few battles, or one massive one with the boss. They traveled for what seemed like hours, but was really only about 30 minutes. The forest blended into itself and it was hard to keep track of time. Sam wished that his system interface had a clock on it, but there was no such luck. They reached a clearing some time later, one that was filled with corpses. Some monster ones, but there were a good few humans in the mix as well. All of them had died by the same manner, massive claw wounds dotting their body. If that was not a sign of the boss, then Sam was afraid of the implication. 
If something that large existed in the forest, and it wasn't even the boss, then it was even more dangerous than he had thought. Chapter 45 Up in their waiting room, the system imprint and Barigis watched the party's progress intently. Both of them sat back in their conjured chairs of mana, and sipped from pitchers of highly expensive void grape wine. Void grapes were a special species of grape that had been bred in order to survive in the space between the stars and as a result, they had a unique flavor that some found enjoyable, but others despised. Of course, there was the added benefit that it was fatal to those under E-rank, but Barigis thought that was a marvelous side effect that meant that only those who deserved to drink it could. Of course, he definitely deserved to drink such a potent brew. It was enough to even make him slightly tipsy, but his companion was barely affected. Barigis sighed and cleansed the alcohol from his system before turning to his ally. Look, there's no fun in it if you don't even bother to pretend that you're enjoying it. I don't understand. Why would people want to have their functions inhibited? I need to be in top condition to be able to complete my tasks. Barigis resigned himself to the fact that the system imprint would never understand and instead he watched the battles below more intently. Well, they found the first trace of the monster. I wonder what they are going to think when they finally encounter the beast for themselves. I went to so much trouble to find that thing, even though it is barely peak F rank at best. It's not my fault that the species is endangered. It was probably in fact partially his fault that it was endangered, but such concerns did not even begin to form in the mind of Barigis. He was right in everything that he did, so there was no room for mistakes. If worst came to worst, he could just blame someone else anyway. Barigis fondly remembered finding such a vicious beast on the moons of Albus four ten thousand years ago and breeding them up into the creatures that they were today. Through recursive genetics he had ensured that they were the pinnacle of their genus and as a result, he ran a profitable side business of supplying guards for tinpot dictators and other people in need of a sentinel that never tired. It was a unique cross-breed between a tree and an octopus that looked somewhat like a gigantic woody squid. Its tentacles were far more dangerous than any living octopus and it produced a potent toxin within its many glands that it secreted from its pores. Upon being grabbed by one of those tentacles, a weaker being would instantly die. This specimen was only F rank, but Barigis had bred the species up to the top of D rank, the most that he was willing to go, both because of monetary constraints and because of personal danger. It would not do to have a creature that was more powerful than himself roaming his lands, would it now? The system imprint had been quite impressed upon seeing the creature when Barigis had shown it the monster a few days ago and it had added a few enhancements of its own to make sure that it was extremely deadly. This event would cause the cream of the crop to rise to the top of the humans, and the weak would be the fuel for their ascension. If all went well, Barigis' little project would be even more powerful after this. As he dreamt of his future glory, the system imprint stiffened. What? Barigis asked, curious about what could cause such a thing to feel fear. Did your master return? The imprint looked at him with thinly veiled annoyance. No, just a little problem down below. I dealt with it. Your little conversation had distracted me, and I was forced to expend much of my reserves to alter the flow of causality, erasing the event from existence. What it was does not concern you. Barigis let out a breath, but let the imprint play its little games. None of them concerned his end goal anyway. Sam hopped down from the bear's back and walked over to one of the corpses. It was unlikely that he could glean anything useful from it beyond what he had already seen, but there was no telling what someone with enhanced senses could find out. It took a moment, but he smelt a sharp, acrid scent coming from one of the wounds. He bent down and looked inside it, seeing a pool of smoking green liquid. It ate away at the skin around it, and it seemed to be turning what remained of it into a strange brown substance. Sam picked up a stick and prodded it, finding that it was hard to the touch. He initially thought that it was a discolored bone, but after seeing that it had ridges in it, he realized that it was bark. That's strange, he said, to nobody in particular. Of course, everyone else crowded around to see what he had found. Eduardo was the first to ask. What did you find on that body? Is it a clue to what the monster who killed them is? The man said with an attempt to look even closer. Sam nodded. Something like that, only it doesn't make sense. The skin around this pool of poison is turning slowly into wood. Nothing that I've ever heard of can do that, although the multiverse is a much larger place that I can say to understand, so there are probably quite a few things that can do this. The boss monster must have some sort of wood-related abilities, perhaps even being a tree itself. Maybe it's some sort of ant, only I don't think that this one is like Treebeard. The reference rolled off everyone back except for Reaper who chuckled. Upon receiving flat stares from the others, he mouthed what? And then fell silent. Sam withdrew from the corpse, suddenly sickened from being near such a perversion of nature. See if any of you can find out more about the poison. I'm going to look at the other bodies. 
Sam walked around the clearing and saw a few more bodies that were further into decay than the one that he had studied. Next to one of them, an unidentifiable brown mass of wood lay on the ground. Sam thought that it might be a tree root, but it was too wide and there were no trees nearby. He crouched down next to it and began to see, to his horror, that it was the remains of a human. The poison had completely transformed this corpse into a pile of wood and the features were barely recognizable. Sam saw a nose poking out of the top half of the wood that he had originally thought to be a twig. There was something deeply disturbing about all of this and the setting made it so much worse. Berigius was probably laughing at them from wherever he was, the sick bastard. Sam went back to the others and saw one of them vomiting on the ground. He hurried over and forced his way into the group to see what was up. The woman, whose name Sam had never found out, was doubled over and retching up the remainder of her last meal on the ground. Sam opened his mouth to ask what was up, but Reaper pointed to something on the ground before he could say anything. A grotesquely long finger twitched on the ground, the end made out of wood. It was extremely thin and it looked like a spider leg, if it was made out of human flesh. Reaper waited until the woman had recovered and then began to explain. We dipped a twig into the poison for a few seconds and then waited to see if anything happened. After a minute, it started to turn into this. Whatever that poison is, it is definitely not natural. Well, knowing the system, it probably is, but what I mean is that it's disgusting. It seemed to be able to turn wood into flesh and flesh into wood. We're dealing with something evil here. It's like something that you would find in a horror movie. Anyway, did you find anything over there? Sam nodded. The poison compounds over time. There was a corpse over there that had completely turned to wood and it was barely recognizable as a person anymore. The only thing that tipped me off was the nose. It was too short and wide to be a branch and it had strange holes in it. The others walked away from the corpse and followed Sam as he made his way off into the woods. As they, perhaps unwisely, continued towards the center of the forest, they encountered more of the transmuted bodies lying on the sides of the trees. Some of them had begun to fuse with the wood of the trees, creating strange sculptures that created ominous shadows on the darkness of the forest. Sam gritted his teeth and ignored them, but his companions were not as stoic. The woman seemed to be almost traumatized by the entire thing and Reaper looked uneasy. Eduardo had a grimace on his face, but he oddly seemed quite a home here. Sam was curious if the man had actually been a real exorcist before the system's arrival. He was sure that there were demons now, but had there really been before? In any case, the man had seen some twisted things during his time in the Vatican. Sometimes, humans could be more evil than any monster. A metallic clanging noise echoed down through the trees ahead, punctuated by a loud roar that sounded identical to the one from earlier, except a bit quieter and without the addition of aura. They were almost there. Chapter 46 Sam nodded to his teammates and motioned for them to stop. All right. This is it. By the sounds of it, someone is already fighting the thing, and from the fact that they have not died yet, I am reasonably sure that it is one of the high rankers, or perhaps multiple of them. We will survey the scene first and then help out. If they try to kill us or betray us, I want you to put them down immediately. Is that understood? They all nodded in agreement and with nothing else to say, they stealthily slipped through the trees, or as much as a group with a ten-foot-tall stone man could, and paused outside of the fight. There was a sunlit area in the middle of the forest and it was about the size of a few football fields. In the middle, a vast tree stood, and it was being attacked by four figures. The tree was not just a tree however, and as it turned towards them, they could see a massive cyclopean eye dominating the center of its upper trunk. Tentacles of moving wood extended out from its upper and lower branches, darting around and trying to catch the fighters. Small drops of green venom dripped down from them and sizzled when they touched the ground. One of the figures, who Sam recognized as anonymous from the mask, clutched their arm from where a drop of the poison had landed earlier. The spread of wood seemed to have stopped, but the entire limb was basically useless. The other three figures were Rodney Kane, the Scourge and the Overlord. They had entered into an uneasy truce with each other and had put aside their differences to deal with the larger threat. Even with all of their power, the three were still outmatched. The Overlord was protected from the venom by his clothing, but he was still tossed around like a ragdoll by the whipping branches of the tree. Apparently tiring of this, he planted his feet and roared out a challenge, fielding his Dao aura for the first time. Everyone except for Sam was blown backwards as if by a gale from the power of the man's aura. Sam himself barely held on, but as he began to field his own aura, the force lessened. Even though the overlord was more powerful than Sam, his Dao was still weaker. Sam was the only person on earth so far to have two Daos, and both of them together were more powerful than the overlords. Unfortunately, the use of his aura attracted the attention of the monster and a tentacle speared down towards them from near the top of the tree. Sam jumped to the side, hoping that the others could avoid it. 
The tentacle moved almost faster than Sam could see, and certainly faster than some of his companions could. The bear did not bother to dodge it, instead relying on his armor to protect him. This worked and the tentacle glanced off of him, instead targeting the woman standing next to him. She tried to cut it in two with her weapon, but it sped up and impaled her on its jagged end, lifting her up and back towards its body. Sam watched in impotent rage as the tree opened up a previously hidden mouth and swallowed her whole. A moment later, a wooden facsimile of the woman popped out of the base of the tree, heading straight for Sam. That explained how the immobile tree had been able to poison people from so far away. It had created minions from the bodies of the slain and used them as agents to spread its foul toxin. Sam and the others burst out of the woods, knowing that their only hope was to have more maneuverability. Whoever had created this boss arena had known what they were doing. It purposefully forced those around it to enter the open space, and in doing so enter the range of the creature's attacks. Sam tried to scan the tree monster, but nothing came up. He tried again, but it was as if the skill did not work anymore. This reeked of the games of the system and Sam added this to his list of grudges against it. Sam hefted his mace and charged directly at the monster, knocking aside the myriad of attacks that sped towards him from on high. He only had one shot at this, and he was going to make this ability count. Sam zigzagged back and forth to avoid the poison on the ground and reached the base of the tree. Imbuing his mace with an even blend of his daos, he triggered its once-a-day ability. A cone of red light erupted out of the mace, colored with white and orange tints. A celestial chime mingled discordantly with a demonic roar as the Dao-infused attack went off. The beam slammed into the tree, carving a ten-foot-wide hole into its side. Sticky sap-like ichor spilled out of it and Sam was filled with a boundless supply of power as his Dao energy flooded back towards him as well as the power of the skill. His body began to glow with light and he jumped up onto the body of the tree. This was a dangerous move as the thing was covered in its green poison, but it evaporated upon touching his skin. Sam clambered up, within the minimum range that the tree needed to properly attack him. He reached its eye with a mere moment to spare and slammed his mace into it with all of his strength. The tree let out an eardrum-bursting roar of pain and fury, blasting Sam off it with the vibrational force of its cry. He rocketed down into the ground, out for the count. Sam woke up a few moments later, his body aching from his overuse of his Tao. His gambit had paid off however and the tree was now inhibited by its lack of clear eyesight. It was able to detect its assailants through the use of some other sense, but it was not as sharp. His companions and the others were in the process of whittling away at the tentacles, blunting, quite literally, its means of attack. Sam got to his feet and was immediately put down into the dirt again as the ground rumbled. The tree screamed in pain as it ripped its roots out of the ground and began to thrash them about. The move seemed to hurt the tree immensely and its bark started to become gray but it was able to seize three of the fighters in the time that it had its roots exposed and began to lower them towards its mouth. As Eduardo, the bear and Rodney Kane dangled over the cavernous mouth of the tree, a flare of light burst out from the trees like a comet and drop kicked the monster. As the light faded, an old man was revealed, limbed in the glow of a masterfully utilized expenditure of Tao energy. A wave of energy coursed up from the point of impact, seemingly doing nothing until it reached the root that grasped the three fighters. The tip of the root exploded outwards in a storm of shards and they were dropped down to the ground. All of them, except for the bear, were covered in the green poison. They were already starting to turn into wood and Sam rushed over to take them to safety. It seemed to be spreading more slowly on them than it had been on the other people, perhaps because of their personal power. In any case, they only had about 30 minutes left to live at the rate that they were transmuting. Profound visionary stared at the tree, his face a mask of impassivity and he began to cycle his hands in a strange pattern. In between them, a glowing ball of energy collected and after a moment, it shot out of his hands towards the tree. It let out a rumbling laugh and slammed its tentacles into the ball, removing it from sight. As it gloated, its noises were suddenly cut off as most of its mouth disintegrated in a ball of blue fire. The old man stumbled backwards but caught himself and watched the aftereffects of his attack. It still was nowhere near dead, but it was going there at this rate. It had too many people to deal with and more of them came every minute. The overlord looked over at Profound Visionary, his mask concealing his true emotions, but Sam believed that he was almost afraid of the old man by the way that he stood. Sam definitely was. That use of his Tao had been far more powerful than anything that Sam had been able to do yet. Despite nominally being above him on the Tao leaderboard, Sam felt like a novice next to him. He needed to find out how to use his Tao more efficiently if he was to stay on top. Chapter 47 Sam began to cycle his Tao within his body and attempted to mimic the movements that Profound Visionary had made. To his horror, his Arbiter moat had a small crack running through it. As he drew energy from it, the crack widened and as he tried to turn it off, 
his Tao of anger began to pour more and more power into his body. As it did so, the crack grew and grew, threatening to split his Tao in half. Sam screamed as a wave of white-hot pain ran over him and he desperately tried to shut down his Daos. Sam slammed his metaphysical fist on them, pushing his Daos into the deepest recess of his soul. Their presence began to recede and he sighed in relief as he stemmed the flow of pain for now. That was a huge problem however as it meant that his Daos were useless to him at the moment. He did not dare to siphon any more power out of them and was now almost completely defenseless. He moved backwards slowly to avoid the attention of the monster but it seemed to home in on the fact that he was weaker now and it sent one of its tentacles towards him. Sam rolled to the side, dodging it, but only barely. He still had all of his stats like before, but he felt strange being cut off from his Tao in the way that he was. It was like losing an organ that you had never noticed before and then feeling the loss more strongly than the actual effects of losing that organ. Sam held his mace in front of himself protectively and used his skill to create some shields around him. He was going to need them. Unfortunately, someone else had other ideas. As Sam retreated from the fight, Andrew Monroe saw his weakness and began to close in on him. In the chaos of the fight, nobody even noticed and Sam was forced to stay and stand his ground. On even ground, he was not confident about his chances to outrun the number 3 ranker in the world. Sam gritted his teeth and raised his mace, waiting for the fight to commence. Monroe walked in without a care in the world, summoning a small dagger to his hands. A strange glint of light reflected off of his eye, almost appearing as if the sunlight had caught a piece of metal. Sam thought nothing of it and strode forwards, to close the distance. The other man cocked his hand back and threw his dagger, his motions a blur. Sam shot his head to the side, narrowly avoiding it, but then he heard a faint whistling noise behind him and the knife buried itself in his spine. Monroe held his hand up and jerked it to the right, making the knife move with it. At this point, the others had caught on to what was happening and they rushed towards them, but then Rodney Kane awoke with a gasp. Miraculously healed from his injuries, it almost looked convincing that he had resisted the effects of the poison all along if it was not for the surreptitiously grasped remains of a healing crystal. Now just any healing crystal, but an F-rank one, something that he had picked up from a black market dealer from another universe who was looking to make a quick profit on something that was like pocket change to him. Not so fast, you bastards. This man is ours, he said with a laugh as he summoned a greatsword out of thin air. It was constructed entirely out of what appeared to be obsidian, and the air around it sagged, as if under the effect of a heat haze. One slash of the weapon created a tear in the air in front of it, summoning a massive wave of black light that streaked through the air towards them. The man had clearly been holding back in order to create an advantage for himself when the actual fight started. The overlord was seemingly unperturbed, continuing to fight the monster. With a glance backward, profound visionary raised one hand, coating it in a layer of blue light. Next to him, a shimmering figure of light appeared, looking almost exactly like him except for its transparent nature. It ran across the grass, almost gliding rather than walking and rushed Sam's assailant. Profound visionary sagged, as if the attack had taken a lot out of him, but ultimately remained standing. The whole time, Sam was trying to mitigate the damage that had been dealt to him by the knife. Luckily, he had thought ahead and had created a barrier on his most vulnerable areas, the small of his back being one of them. The knife had still penetrated quite deeply into him and it was creating a small torrent of blood that dripped down his back. Cursing as he removed it, Sam dropped the knife to the ground and set his eyes on Andrew Monroe. They were glistening with rage and as he stumbled forwards, his Tao of anger ignited. All of his attempts to control it had fallen to the wayside and it blazed like a second sun in the center of his being, causing a wave of fiery light to rise up around his entire body. Sam roared, the sound imbued with the power of pure anger creating a shockwave of force that knocked Andrew Monroe backwards, the scourge of New York no match for such a raw expression of the Tao. Sam's body began to fall apart and his other Tao cracked even further. In his heart of hearts, Sam watched with mounting dread as his body tore itself apart on the blades of its own wrath and damned him to an eternity of evil. Such blind rage was the opposite of what his original Tao had stood for and it chafed against the nugget of himself that was encapsulated in the soul of Sam Atlas. A booming, mocking laugh echoed out over the arena, from somewhere above them. Sam was the only one who appeared to hear it, the rest of the fighters too embroiled in their battles to register the sound. Sam screamed again as his Tao fractured further and the light of anger began to corrupt it. It was breaking apart under the strain, and there was nothing that he could do to stop it. It was like there was a raging inferno inside him, and all that he had to stop it was a single drop of water, a drop that was swiftly evaporating before his very eyes. Just when he thought that he was about to pass the point of no return, time stopped. All around him, the movements of all life simply ceased to be. The air around him was frozen in a snapshot of eternity, 
creating a tableau of strangely distorted images. Out of a rent in the air, a being emerged. It was created from an impossible color, one that had a meaning more spiritual than visual, something that broadcasted its meaning of every wavelength, and some more besides. This was something that had existed since the beginning, and perhaps even before that. With a voice like the sundering of planets, and the softest whisper of a child at night, the being spoke. Chapter 48 Sam Atlas dash upon seeing that Sam had clapped his hands to his ears at the sound, the being stopped. Oh, right. I apologize for my misjudgment of your power. Wait, you are barely beyond mortal at all. How can this be? My progeny have been seated across the multiverse and the rest of the boundless expanse by now. Why are you the only one left? How can this be? The being's voice morphed into a poignant paean of loss as it said the last words, the sorrow of all of existence seemingly contained within its words. It stared at Sam with blazing eyes, a confused expression on its indescribable face. It reached down with one of its hands and laid it on Sam's face. A feeling of warmth suffused his body and he leaned into the hand, searching for more of that warmth. It spread throughout his body, bringing a feeling of contentment and bliss with it. The figure withdrew its hands far too quickly, and Sam desperately reached for them. But they were already out of reach, seemingly a universe away. The eyes of mortals were not meant to see something of this power and as a result of its safeguards to prevent the immediate dissolution of Sam's very being, he was blinded from the truth of its movements. To Sam's surprise, his daos had been fixed, for now. They were still heavily damaged, but the taint had stopped spreading. After a moment of contemplative silence, the figure spoke again. That might be why my other children are no longer with us. I made them to parse and control a certain dao, but in their journey, they must have touched upon other, similar concepts. That created something similar to what happened to you, creating a fracture in their soul. You however are different somehow. What exactly is it that is so special about you? Sam tried to answer, but his voice would not leave him and instead he was left looking up at the creature with boundless admiration. A moment later, the being froze. No, it cannot be. Has it really been that long since I last checked in? What has the system done to me? My old friend, where are you? High up above, a crack formed in creation, showing a sliver of something that blasted Sam's mind like a close-range nuclear explosion. It was wiped completely blank by the sight of higher dimensional constructs and the raw power of a system overseer. A booming voice rang out, but Sam could not hear it, lost in a white fog of complete brain death. The being that had appeared in front of Sam gave him one last look and tapped his forehead, before leaving the way he had come, narrowly avoiding a lance of energy that stabbed down at it. Just before it hit the ground, it was redirected through a portal to avoid any contact with the lower order matter that this universe was made up of. Sam remembered nothing of this encounter, instead coming to awareness with a strange ringing sensation in his head and the indescribable relief of his daos being stabilized once more. All around him, the other fighters were still embroiled in battle, and Sam had the vaguest sense that something important had happened but a moment ago. But for the life of him, he could not remember what. Remembering something more important in the moment, that he was in the middle of a fight, he narrowly avoided another throwing dagger sent his way by Andrew Monroe. Now that he had seen his tricks before, Sam knew what was going on. The man had some sort of magnetic control over his weapons allowing him to control them from a distance. The reason that Sam knew that it was not telekinetic control was that only the knife was affected. As the man threw it again, Sam raised his mace and blocked it with the hilt. The other man smiled and thrust his hand to the side, sending the weapon around the mace and towards Sam's eye. He had been banking on this the entire time and now, with his vastly increased dexterity since entering the forest, he caught it. The dagger struggled against him, but it was no match for someone with over forty strength. That level of power put him far above a normal human and there was only so much magnetism could do without the presence of a magnet that was inconveniently large. In the end, the magnet size was limited to something that the other man could carry and use effectively to control the dagger. Monroe's face lit up with rage when he realized that his trick had been stymied and he moved in to engage in melee combat. Sam let out a breath to steady himself and he held his mace in a tight grip, ready for some more magnetic trickery. Luckily, his mace was not made of metal so it would be immune to the other man's abilities. Sam wondered how he had found magnets powerful enough to work from so far away, and then realized that he could have just gained an ability from the system. However, he had never heard of such a thing, so it was clear that the man had a few secrets. Sam waited until the last moment and then made his move. He swung his mace in a horizontal arc, creating a small zone of control for himself. As Monroe stepped backwards, Sam pressed his advantage. The other man twisted around his weapon like oil around a patch of water, and then struck with the speed of lightning. Not just figuratively, but literally as well. A small spark formed in his hand, 
and then grew and grew until the dagger was surrounded by a halo of electricity. With the sharp scent of ozone, his hand thrust forwards, too fast for Sam to see. It was only pure luck that the attack glanced off his mace, hitting him in the arm instead of the body. It seemed that his opponent was unable to control the attack very well, and it took a toll on his body as well. The faint smell of burning flesh came from his hand and it was charred slightly around his fingertips. The man growled at Sam and stopped using his abilities, instead relying on his martial prowess. He had clearly been trained in the use of his weapon before the system arrived and he was far more proficient in it than Sam was with his mace. The dagger seemed like a poor choice against a weapon with such power and reach as a mace, but Monroe made it look like it was the other way around with how skillful he was. Wounds slowly started to mount on Sam's body as he tried to land a strike on his opponent, not succeeding even once. The other man was too skilled for Sam to deal with, and his higher stats on account of his level were edging the fight even further into his favor. This fight was not sustainable, unless Sam found some way to tip the scales a little. None of his friends and allies were available to help as they were all tied up with their fight with the tree monster. It was just him and him alone. Racking his brain for any way out of this situation, he remembered something that he had seen a while ago. In his skill branch area, he could gain a certain degree of weapon proficiency for 50 points. He had wanted to save up his point for something better, but there was no choice. He dumped the points into the skill and immediately seized up as an electric current of information entered his brain. Countless stances and attacks vied for his attention in his mind and after a brief moment, he knew how to perform them. As his enemy moved in to capitalize on what looked like a lapse in attention, Sam shut his eyes and moved. Chapter 49 As the dagger entered his guard and seemed to pass through it, Sam twisted his mace and caught Monroe's hand in it. With a sharp yank, he broke the man's wrist and threw him high into the air above him. With a pained yell, the other man thrust downwards with his other hand to kill Sam, but he was ready for him. Monroe was unable to dodge while in the air and Sam cocked back his arms, ready to blast the man's head off of his body with the next swing of his mace. The other man tried to cover himself up with his hands, desperately trying to stave off death. Right as the mace was about to connect, a bright light enveloped the scene and they were blown backwards from each other. The tree monster had finally died and a rush of essence filled Sam, almost feeling tangible as it did so. He tried to move back towards Monroe, but an invisible force stopped him from doing so. Berigis floated down from the air, like some parody of an angel and touched down on the ground. Well done, all of the survivors here. This event achieved my goal of killing off all of those who were under a certain level on the leaderboard. I am very pleased with your performance, especially the ones who actually killed the boss. For that, you each shall receive a special weapon, themed after the boss. A small box fell out of the sky in front of Sam and similar boxes, some smaller, some larger, fell in front of the others. It opened as it hit the ground, revealing a small brooch. Ignoring the trinket, Sam roared and rushed Berigis, trying desperately to reach him. Before he had even moved an inch, a gravity field slammed down around him, pressing him into the ground. The system would not tolerate such aggression within the bounds of the arena. Berigis wagged his finger at Sam and then laughed, before floating back up into the sky. Sam lay there, a toxic wrath filling his being, for once not inflaming his Dao mode of anger. Whatever had happened to him that had patched up his Daos had stopped them from influencing his being, at least for now. All around them, the forest began to peel back, as if it had been an illusion all along. The sunlight expanded until it filled the entire arena, which was the same size as it had always been. All around them, other fighters appeared, far closer than they should have been based on how large the forest had been but a few moments ago. More common than the fighters were the corpses however. Sam gazed up to the packed stands filled with the remaining members of Earth, and lost hope when he heard their deafening cheers for the spectacle that they had just witnessed. Berigis stood on thin air in the middle of the arena, with both hands raised in supplication. I'm glad that you enjoyed the event, but I am not the one to thank. It was actually the Arbiter who thought of this whole thing and told me, in hopes that you would enjoy it. He knew that you would all find it entertaining, and as he is a local of this planet, I deferred to his wisdom. Berigis flashed Sam a devious smile after he said this that went unnoticed by everyone except for him. All around Sam, the other fighters turned, with rage on their faces. What did I just hear? Reaper said, an ugly look on his face. Both of his fists were coated in ectoplasm and he held them towards Sam in a threatening manner. Sam began to grind his teeth together and a red haze filled his vision. Berigis had set up this entire thing, just to make him an enemy of everyone else. But why? What was the point? Just to have some fun at the expense of a weaker universe? Sam couldn't do anything with the anger however, and it looked to the others as if he was ignoring them. Reaper turned to everyone else and sighed. See? 
he's not even repentant, he said, pointing at Sam. I say that we kill him, here and now. All of the others began to move towards Sam, except for Eduardo, profound visionary, and surprisingly enough, the overlord. Of course, the first of the men was still unconscious, but Sam was sure that he would have rushed to his aid if he was able. A few of the others looked back in surprise at the holdouts, but they continued to move towards Sam. With a growl, an overwhelming aura exploded out of the overlord, petrifying everyone except for Sam and profound visionary. It was imbued with the full power of the man's Tao and it was yet another reason why the man was number one on the leaderboard. His body seemed to be coated in a layer of pure power as he strode forwards, before standing in front of Sam. I want this man to die, just as much as the rest of you, but stop and think about the situation for a moment. We are being purposefully tricked by our dear host, and he is trying to make us attack the Arbiter. Have none of you asked yourselves why? I stand for myself first, but for Earth second. Why should we let some alien bastard control us to this extent? Earth should be for humanity, not the aliens. There is something else going on here, and this man is the key. If none of you listen to me, then I will have to kill you. Nobody moved, as much terrified from the speech as from the aura. Then Reaper let out a roar of rage, before stalking off to the arena door. With that, the rest of them dispersed and Sam was left alone with the Overlord. He had caught the last few moments of the Overlord's diatribe and was confused as to why he had helped him. Before he could say a word to the man, he walked away, leaving Sam standing there in utter confusion. Then he too left the arena, feeling the hot glare of Barigis on his back the entire time. Sam rushed back to his room, and made sure that he did not stop to talk to anyone. Almost everyone was against him now, and despite the ban of violence within the living quarters, he would not trust Barigis to not slip something by. With a relieved gasp, he tore open his door and rushed inside, sitting down on one of the sofas with a grunt. There was a lot to unpack. Sam started first with the state of his daos. Both of them were in poor condition, and worse, he had no idea how they had gotten like that. There were entire libraries full of what he did not know about the boundless expanse, and archives the size of galaxies that contained everything that he would never learn. More melancholy thoughts began to intrude into his psyche, for the first time in a while. His past was a tangled morass of loss, bad luck and confusion that he had no wish to encounter again. Unfortunately, his mind, divested of anything to take its attention away, began to work overtime in creating visions of his past life. Chapter 50 His early life was normal enough, the son of two middle-class parents who both loved him as they should. He reached the age of five without any sort of strife in his life, but then his mother fell ill with what initially seemed to be a minor skin condition, but over the following months revealed itself to be cancer. Sam had always been precocious and he fully understood what was happening to his mother at the time, making the experience so much worse. Afterwards, his father had been like a ghost of a man, lingering around his mother's belongings like a wraith constructed from longing and regret. Luckily for Sam, he did not slip into a depressive cycle of violence and abuse, but what actually happened was almost as bad. Seven years later, his father, after having gone through a litany of girlfriends and attempts to heal the pain, killed himself. Sam still remembered walking in on his father, hanging from the living room roof, dead as dead could be. His face had been a strange shade of purple and Sam remembered cutting him down and calling the emergency services before gathering up all of his belongings and walking out of the house, never to return. After that, he had relied on the money of unscrupulous businessmen and restaurant owners, willing to hire someone of his age. After he reached 16, he found legitimate employment and paid for a proper education. Since then until the present day, he had drifted in and out of jobs, getting by with just enough left over after food and rent to at least pretend that he was enjoying himself. It had been a hollow semblance of a life however, and until the system came, he did not really understand just how hollow it was. A tear welled up unbidden in his eye as he dealt with the long repressed feelings. Was there perhaps a way, some infinitude of years off into the future for him to become powerful enough to bring back the dead? Was such a thing possible to the true powers of the multiverse? For that question, he had no answer, which was perhaps just as well. If he had known that resurrecting the dead was possible, then he would have lost all sight of himself in his quest to do so. If he had found out that it was not possible, then he would sink even further into depression. After thirty minutes, he reeled in his wayward emotions and checked his system logs to distract himself. You have killed a Sylvanian horror. You have leveled up. X2. He was now level 29, and he checked his system interface to see everything that was new with his status. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 29. 6 free stat points. Strength. 40. 1.325x. Constitution. 30. 1.325x. 
Resilience, 28, 1.325x. Dexterity, 25, 1.325x. Intelligence, 28, 1.325x. Wisdom, 35, 1.325x. Health 300 slash 300. Mana 280 slash 280. Stamina 400 slash 400. Dao. Dao mode of the arbiter. Dao mode of anger. Skills. 1x common, 1x rare, 1x epic, 2x legendary. Titles. 1x celestial. Temporary titles. 1x epic, 1x legendary, 1x mythical. Dao heritage. Dao incarnation of existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, level 24. Health 310 slash 310. Racks, level 23. Health 320 slash 320. Skill branches. Muscle density enhancement, level 1. Basic weapon knowledge, blunt, level 1. Sam had a few points to spend and he was shocked by just how much he was getting out of his legendary class combined with his title bonuses. Instead of getting 6 points into intelligence from 3 levels like he should have, he had gotten 8, and even more ridiculously, he had received 12 whole points into wisdom for his trouble. It was quite ridiculous, and it might have even been enough to keep him ahead of the curve without access to his daos. Afterwards, he checked his skill branches to see how many points he had left. He had 45 skill branch points remaining after his purchases and he tracked them out to see if that was correct. He gained 5 skill points per level which meant that he had received a total of 145 points. Out of those, he had spent 100 on skills which meant that he had 45 remaining. Satisfied that his math worked out, Sam moved on to the next and unexpected prompt. Weapon imprint successful. Somebody high up in the multiverse must be smiling favorably on you today. You have been granted an incredibly rare weapon imprint from a powerful cultivator and as such are privy to a fraction of their skills. Jeridan Halrax, the d rank cultivator king of the Mantor Galactic System in Universe 9345685241 is the unwitting provider of your imprint. He provided his weapon skills to the system long ago in exchange for special bonuses. Your benefactor purchased these and gave them to you. His fighting style revolves around the dynamic use of blunt weaponry, eschewing the standard mantra of standing still and relying on heavy armor to defend yourself as you crush your opponents into the ground with a massive greatsword. Of course, there is still a lot of crushing involved in his style, but it is a dynamic form of crushing. As you progress further and your stats grow to the point where you can successfully perform the more complicated techniques, the wealth of information available to you will grow. Current level of weapon mastery has been set to implement stage 5. You now possess the acumen to wield your weapon with a level of skill greater than the mortal average. Well done. The entire message had a faintly mocking tone to it, as if to express some internal displeasure of the system at having to give it to Sam. The second message was more engaging however, as it provided Sam with an idea of what was ahead of him as a wielder of the mace. He was starting to become attached to the weapon, after only a bit over a week of using it, and now that he actually possessed the knowledge of its effective use, he found it more comfortable than any tool he had used before. Sam knew that much of the feeling was artificial, but as time progressed, he would become better at using the weapon on his own. Now emboldened and slightly more happy than he had been a moment ago, Sam stood up and made his way over to the training area. It was time to test his new acumen against the training robot.